as we continue in Isaiah 53, it is my opinion that nobody should go through the Easter season without reading through Isaiah 53 in preparation. We said last time that Isaiah 53 was written about 700 years before Christ, that it was a passage that was largely misunderstood by the Jewish people in that day because they understood that Jesus was going to come as the conquering king. But they couldn't understand these words of Isaiah 53. They knew it was messianic, but couldn't understand what it means that he would come and be wounded and bruised. And it's kind of confusing. And, and, and it's in the richness of that, actually, of understanding, of harmonizing all of that, that we begin to understand who Jesus is and what he was really doing. So let's read through Isaiah 53. Let's pick up where we left off last time and, um, and hear again uh, words to, for Jesus to prepare us for this Resurrection Sunday. Heavenly Father, would you speak to us through your word? We thank you for these powerful words. We thank you. I thank you for the people that you put in my life um, who, um, who would read Isaiah 53 and your Holy Spirit's power was just really clearly speaking. And that's my prayer that you would do that right now. Through Christ, I pray. Amen. Uh, as I alluded in my prayer, some um, who uh, are following this um, devotion will remember Al Roberts, an elderly man in my home church growing up. And from time to time, he would give an, a, a communion meditation, a thought before communion, and he would just stand up and he would quote Isaiah 53 from memory. And I came to love Isaiah 53, listening to Al Roberts quote Isaiah 53 and I used to think it's because I was so impressed with him, and I certainly am. But I come to realize it's the power of the Holy Spirit using the power of his word. And my prayer is that the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of his word would so move you today as we continue in Isaiah 53. Let these words penetrate your soul. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Honest people can't look at the cross without seeing the iniquity of us all. I see the cross and I see how true it is that all we like sheep have gone astray, how I have gone astray. The d conviction just deepens when you get to that verse that says, and we have all turned everyone to his own way. The wonderful thought on that for us, the insight on that is um, Jesus didn't go on the cross just because I am defiant, openly defiant of God. You know, Jesus didn't go to the cross. My sin is not just a matter of me like raising a fist toward God and saying, God, I'm angry at you or God, I, I'm not going to do what you want. I'm in complete rebellion against you. We've turned everyone to his own way. What sent Jesus to the cross is my independent spirit. It's that God says, go straight. And I say, you know what? I think I want to just take this little angle here that's less than straight. It is what my Old Testament professor called uh, my desire to be the master of my destiny. You know, the, the, the master of my own domain. I don't want anybody else telling me what to do. And while there's a part of me I know better, I know that God is so much wiser than I am. One of the great struggles that I have is, will I completely surrender to God with all that I have, time, treasure, talents, thoughts, principles, decisions, or will I hedge? Will I just say, I'll follow God as long as he agrees with me, as long as it's easy, as long as his ideas and my ideas line up. But if he ever calls me to do something that's a little bit difficult or that I don't agree with, I, you know what, God, I think my way's better. We've turned everyone to his own way. Verse 7 goes on. It says, he was oppressed and afraid. Afflicted, he did, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb to the slaughter, led to the slaughter. As a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Talk about self-control, the innocent one. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. 
and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressors of my, transgressions of my people, he was afflicted, stricken. Um, Jesus is God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And yet, because of my sin, he was cut off from life. He died. He was cut off from the land of the living. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Can you blame the Jewish people for not understanding that? You know, this makes no sense. This is kind of like listening to the big, to, you know, Hotel California. It's kind of like, what are you guys talking about? You know, it doesn't make any sense. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, but the rich were understood to be blessed by God. The wicked were cursed by God. You're saying he was cursed and yet he was with the, that doesn't make sense at all. And because he'd done no violence, he, he, he's made a grave with the wicked because he'd done no violence, no deceit found in his mouth. Those are pictures of uh, images, really, of just kind of absolute perfection. There was no deceit found in his mouth. Um, in ancient times, to, they, they spoke of somebody's behavior as their conversation. I mean, even in the King James Version of the Bible, for instance, 1611, when it uses the word conversation, Today, that very same word is translated lifestyle, you know, where it might say you in the King James Version, you will be known by the conversation, by your conversation, the, say the New International Version will be translated, you'll be known by your lifestyle. Because in ancient times, and this goes back, you know, well beyond the 17th century, your conversation and your lifestyle were seen as the same. That's why James says in the book of James that if you can keep your tongue in control, the whole, the whole, perf- the whole body will be perfect because they understood, as Jesus said, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when it says here that there was no deceit found in his mouth, it's saying so much more than just he didn't say anything untrue. It's saying his whole life was, was perfect. And yet... He was given a grave with the wicked. How in the, I mean, this is a Gordian knot that they could not untie. You know, even with a sharp ax, they just couldn't undo it. So how in the world do you make? Now we look back and it makes so much sense to us, doesn't it? We look back and we say, oh, made a grave with the wicked. He, he died on a cross with thieves and yet, with the rich in his death, he was buried in, her, in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, in a rich man's tomb. And why did that happen? It wasn't because he had done anything wrong. I mean, who would crucify a perfect man? Well, we know why they would crucify, why they crucified a perfect man now, don't we? See, we look at the events of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, and on this side of history, what do we see? On this side of history, we look back and we see, oh, look at God's love. Look at God's wisdom. But on that side of history, they weren't sure what to do with it. it didn't, how is God's wisdom in this? How's God's love in this? Does that give you some encouragement for what you're going through right now? Sometimes when we're in the middle of difficulties, it's like, I don't see God's love. I don't see God's wisdom. How can this be God's love? How can this be God's wisdom? But it's only in a future time that you can look back. It's only from a godly perspective that we can see his love and wisdom. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He's put him to grief when he makes, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Those are pretty good words to remember as well when we find ourselves confused by painful experiences that God is allowing us to experience. It says, it pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. And yet the pleasure of the Lord prospered in his hand. In the New Testament, we use the same, that same type of thought as expressed in Romans chapter 8, where the apostle Paul says that God works all things together for good to those who love him and have called according to his purpose. Again, Sometimes it's God's pleasure to allow us to be bruised. Sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes injustice is experienced. 
because God is working about an ultimate, better act of love and good. Verse 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. Just as if we've never sinned. He shall bear their iniquities. Let's talk about you and me today. Does it make your heart swell with joy to think that God's righteous servant has justified you, has made justification possible, at least? Does it make you just say, praise the Lord? I want to worship you, Lord. There's no deeper debt than I have than a debt of gratitude that you have done for me what nobody else could ever have done. You've washed away my sin and made me clean so that I can have hope and peace. Thank you, Lord. Verse 12, therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. This is an imagery of victory, of a victorious uh, leader, because he poured out his soul unto death. He poured himself out. He emptied himself, you might say, even to the point of death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressions. When I hear that language, my thoughts go to Philippians chapter 2. I wonder if the Apostle Paul, who was very well versed in Isaiah 53, had Isaiah 53 in mind when he wrote, Therefore, what happened as a result of Jesus being obedient in this way, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. So what do you read when you read Isaiah 53? What we have just read, understand, is the core of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I just wonder, what do you hear God saying to you today? What we have just read reminds us that from the foundation of the world, when Adam and Eve invited sin to come in and destroy this world, God had a plan to bring redemption. God had a plan to bring peace where there was no peace, where there would be no peace unless he was the one to bring peace. And his plan was that peace sacrifice in his son, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53 reminds us several devotional thoughts that you may want to take with you one or two. First, it reminds us just how horrible sin is. There are many battles in the Civil War that some historians will describe and then call them a, a very bloody affair. Shiloh, a very bloody affair. Antietam, a very bloody affair. Some will look at the beaches of Normandy in World War II and say a very bloody affair. When you read Isaiah 53, it is a very bloody affair. There's blood all over. The blood of Christ is all over Isaiah 53. And what caused all the blood is your sin and mine. And it reminds us, all of that blood reminds us just how ugly our sins are. And the sins that are causing the ugliness, let's be clear, are not just the bad sins of other people. It's not the murder and the rape of other people. That It is my independent spirit. It is my unwillingness to obey, to surrender, to listen. My sin put him there. And that sin is ugly. And that causes us to be humbled and to be joyful at forgiveness. Isaiah 53 also reminds us of the perfect nature of our forgiveness. God sent his perfect son to live a perfect life, to die in the perfect way on the cross, to be made a perfect sacrifice. And all of this is predicted by a perfect prophecy. So even though all we like sheep have gone astray and we've turned everyone to his own way and the, the Lord has laid on 
him the sins, the iniquities of us all. What we are reading there, what we are witnessing in Isaiah 53 is absolute perfection. Let me say that again. Isaiah 53, we are witnessing absolute perfection. Sometimes people are like, I could have come up with a better way to bring salvation. I mean, God, couldn't God have just like looked the other way at sin? Couldn't God have done it a, a better way? No. Isaiah 53 reminds us a perfect God sent a perfect son to live a perfect life, to die a perfect sacrifice in the perfect way. Perfect predictions. Absolute perfection. So what? And what's the result? Now you have perfect forgiveness in Christ if Jesus is indeed your Savior and Lord. Isaiah 53 not only reminds us of the perfection of our forgiveness, but it also then reminds us of the greatness of our calling as well. Verse 10 says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Jesus lived to please the Father. Jesus' pleasure was to please the Father. God's pleasure was to accomplish his ultimate purposes in his Son. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 then points it to us and says, Jesus calling is Jesus calling is to please the Father, and so is ours. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself nothing, of no reputation, but emptied himself is the language. Isaiah's language was he poured out himself, taking the form of a servant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearances of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And therefore God lifted him to the highest place. Peter picks up the same themes of Isaiah 53 when he puts the challenge to us and what our attitude should be in life as well. 1 Peter 2, 21, for you were called, to this you were called, this is your calling, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth, a direct quote from Isaiah 53. Verse 23, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Does that sound familiar? For you were like sheep going astray. That sound familiar? But we have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. So what do you hear in Isaiah 53? Isaiah 53 has had such a profound impact that it's often referred to or quoted in the New Testament. We've just seen one time where Paul is alluding to it. Now Peter is referring to it several times in this one passage. Let me encourage you to read through Isaiah 53, devotionally, once or twice, and listen to what God would say to you about the greatness of our sin, but the perfection of our righteousness in Christ, the joy that we have and the great calling that we have then to follow in Jesus' steps. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I would invite you to surrender your life to Christ today. We'd love to help you every step of the way. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, who do you know who needs to know the Savior. Heavenly Father, may you work powerfully through your word. May you do more than human effort could as we surrender to you and ask you to make us your church and your people. Um, Lord, there are people that are really lost without you in this world. We are all lost without you. Help us to follow in Jesus' steps and to trust and to then live to please you that you might be um, 
pleasing to more, but that you ultimately might be honored in all. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you soon. Keep praying and fasting.